All right, now live. <clears throat> Making assumptions. I've had a lot of assumptions being made lately, so I wanted to touch on that. Let me uh, make sure everything's working right here, plugged in correctly. I got good audio. I think I got good audio. Let's see if anybody comes on board. <clears throat> Frank, what's up, my friend? How are you tonight? Cody, what's going on? <laughs> You're here to learn something? We're going to talk about making assumptions. Making assumptions. Let's see. Um, the past few days I've run into, oh, a bunch of, a bunch of assumptions that are being made. So we start having conversations on an assumption, right? And the assumption is incorrect. You know, there we're, we're skipped. We've skipped past step one and gone to step two. Frank, you've been trespassing. Hmm. I'm gonna have some um some merch. Check it out. So you know what you need is one of these. Okay. And I'll explain why. Because you're never trespassing when you're wearing one of my shirts. You're conducting a fish population assessment in the wrong location. You like that one? say oh no and then you give him my number and i'll cover for you it's like wait a minute what's frank doing frank's always messing up <laughs> you like that one frank that's right it's not fishing you're never fishing you're conducting a fish population assessment with hook and line you could be conducting a fish population assessment with electro fishing you could be conducting it with sane or net fight nets hoop nets Today, we're doing a fish population assessment with hook and line. So you can get you guys talking like a biologist. You can talk your way at anything. I've never used any of this stuff to get out of trespassing, I promise. Fortunately for me, I don't really have to trespass. Um, I've got plenty of places to fish and, and have for a long time. I'm taking my allergy medications this week. So hopefully I can, um, oh, you know, keep it going without having a, an attack. Five folks. All right. All right. Let's get going. If you guys have any questions about this stuff, just throw them up there and I will, I'll get to it. So making assumptions and get my microphone a little bit closer. It's not, there it goes. I've been noticing like how I need to get one of those foam things too. It, to take some of the, some of the, it's like the peas will, you can hear the peas kind of crack in the microphone. I see why they use those things now. I'm learning. I'm, I'm getting it going. But you got to watch where the, uh, it has like a little, a little dial on this thing. You see that it makes like a little light and it kind of work, works like an equalizer. And if it doesn't go into the yellow, your voice won't sound right. And if it doesn't, if it goes into the red, you're too close to it. I don't know. It's interesting. Anyway, made notes, assumptions, right? Making assumptions. Okay. So the first assumption that I ran into uh, this week was in talking about genetics. Okay. And how we are um, using you know, tracking the genetics and using genetics as an example in our uh, sport fishing pond at Sugar Hill. So I've seen this a bunch. I mean, for 30 years now, a lot longer than that. Um, before I even knew fisheries, I was listening to these conversations about genetics. And when you start immediately talking about genetics, you're making the assumption that all fish grow at the same rate in all bodies of water. 
Okay. You're just assuming that that's how it is. And believe me, most guys do. And most guys are way wrong because making that assumption is incorrect. Not all bass grow at the same rates in all lakes. And as a matter of fact, at this point, most bass don't grow uh, very well between 12 and 14 inches. They get there and they get stuck and they can be there stuck for years. They can be stuck there their whole lives. Um, without sufficient protein intake, bass stop growing. Fish stop growing. It's not just a bass deal, right? So that's making a huge assumption. So again, we start talking about genetics. These guys are, oh, I'm throwing genetics. I'm, I'm putting Florida genetics in my pond, for example. That's normally the most common thing you hear. Okay. Well, what have you just done? You've completely left out what your forage is looking like. You've comp completely left out what competing species are there affecting your forage base. You've completely left out how many different forms of competing species you have. What you've gone and done there is just proven the fact that uh, you don't know what you're talking about when you skipped past balance and gone straight to talking about genetics. We'll get one Josh coming in here. I'm not really following what that what, what that means, man. Sorry, I get. He's probably talking about something I said a minute ago, and my brain's already off of it. But, um, so the first thing in setting up the pond we did was we we made sure that we put in only the forage that the bass wanted. We put in the bluegill and we put in some red ear. We did stock some grass carp as well, but the grass carp kind of fall outside of, since they're vegetarian fish, they fall outside of the food web that we have to worry about with the bass, right? They're not really taking up the biomass um, in a way that that's going to affect the bass population very much. And I know this because I've just used grass carp for so many years. They um, they get big, you know, they control weeds. Grass carp can't even process protein. You'll hear people say, oh, they eat fish eggs and stuff like that. They can't even, it's like trying to feed meat to a cow. They, they just, it doesn't compute, right? Um, they don't eat. They don't affect what bass are eating. They don't affect what bluegill are eating. So they don't affect that food web. That being said, um, that's just a fallacy I hear, you know, again, just trying to clear up all this you know, bad information that floats around everywhere. So making that assumption that all you have to do is stock bass, and that's another, and that's another assumption, like so I've seen guys make it, okay, so they have a pond full of stunted bass. The reason their bass are stunted is there's generally too many of them, or there's competing species like crappy in the pond negatively impacting bass growth. So since they don't understand balance, it's got to be genetic because nobody's talked about balance on TV for the last 30 years. They only talk about genetics. But if you've noticed too, the guys on TV who so, so proudly talk about all these genetics don't have degrees in genetics. They don't even have science degrees, right? They're just talking out of their rear end, so to speak. <clears throat> yeah, there's my friend Stephen Patrick. Um, again, if you guys don't know Stephen, I think you're probably all the same dudes that are here, but Stephen is a fisheries biologist who works for the state of Georgia. He's uh, the head of the extension and uh, is a great source of information. We try to pride ourselves on being good sources of information, don't we, Stephen? Uh, Stephen's, um, Stephen's a smart dude and has helped me a lot, and I've done my best to help him, you know, in ways that I can with, you know, field experience and, you know, weed treatments and stuff like that. But he's right. I mean, everything we're talking about right here matters more than genetics. Um, genetics is kind of the default position that guys skip to when they don't know what they're talking about. So watch for that. Um, it was, it'll tip you off pretty quickly about 
how much somebody knows about a subject. You know, when they skip steps one, two, and three, and they're down on step four, you know, that'll give you an idea. And that's exactly what bringing up genetics, you know, in the beginning of the conversation. And another thing too, like making assumptions. Okay, so like Florida bass, keeping it on genetics. Florida bass, the range for Florida bass is Florida. That's why they're called Florida bass. And up the coast, you know, I think probably the traditional range because the the temperate climate is a little closer, you know, to the coast. You'll get them up up the coast. I've seen some maps that'll show it going up, like you know, towards the outer banks. You know, you can have Florida bass in those areas. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe Stephen, you can throw on there. Do you know exactly where these ranges lie? I don't even think there's an accurate way to measure them anymore because of all of the overlap stocking, just bucket biologists have taken bass and thrown them everywhere. You also have to consider all the ponds that have been stocked everywhere. Any of those ponds that failed or even any of those ponds that got high water flow and just had fish escape down the rivers, down the streams, you know, and out everywhere, you're going to have, um, you know, that genetic mix up. And there's one guy that I follow on Facebook. I can't remember his name now, but they're doing genetic studies in Kentucky. And, you know, they're coming up. They got, they already have Florida genetics everywhere. And it's like, duh, you know, they, they people have flung around F1s and flung around Florida bass for so long. It's impossible not to have them everywhere. And I don't think that you could track the actual range of where these fish, you know, naturally occur and probably couldn't really get a good grasp of that for the last 30 years, maybe longer, you know, um, point being is I could take bass fry out of a ditch from anywhere and put them in a pond. I don't care where they came from, stick them in a pond. And if you set it up the way we set up sugar Hill, you get the, you get the bluegill population, right. And especially if you get the bluegill population on feed daily, like we've had it, you know, that, that changes the game right there because the bass are eating bluegill that are higher than natural densities because of the feed. And they're also heavier than they would be without the feed. So it's just a simple conversion factor. It takes 10 pounds of forage for one bass to grow one pound. So in an unfed pond, you know, say the average bluegill is like 0.25 pounds, but you start feeding those bluegill and that doubles their weight. Now they're all, now the average bluegill is 0.5 pounds. Well, that's a two for one special for the bass. It's like getting two meals in one. That's what, that's how that works. It's how those bass, you know, get going. So there's another place of making an assumption. Um, you can't just assume that the forage base is perfect for the bass to grow. I mean, we've got bass in Sugar Hill right now that are 2.3 pounds. Those are the Floridas. And we've got bass that are 4.1. We've had uh, 3.9, 3.85. Those are the Northerns. They're two pounds heavier now than the Floridas. I expected that. If you guys have been following me on Instagram, I called that years ago. I didn't expect it to be two pounds difference after two growing seasons, though. I, I thought there'd be a little less discrepancy in those weights. There's not. The, the northerns are growing similar to what you see F1s. Actually, F1s grow faster than this. If I can get one of these ponds to come down the line here, we can put some F1s in there. Um, we'll see it. F1s grow like rockets, more like two and a half pounds is, is if you stock, uh, F1s at like 40 fish per acre, you'll get two and a half pounds, um, in about 11 months. If you, and that's like one growing, if you put them in, in June, by the next June, you're going to have bass over two and a half pounds. If you stock 35 bass breaker, if you go a little lighter, you'll get even more than that. You'll get them to three. I've um, done that several times, probably. I don't know, even know how many. I have to go back and count. Several times. So you can predict 
the rate I can predict anyway, the rate at which these fish are going to grow by the density that you stock them. The lighter the density. Now you can't go so low. You can't go like 10 bass break or even 20 because what happens in that situation is the bluegill population is so dense. And there's so many bluegill that the bass um, won't have successful spawns. Their, their nests will get raided. Their eggs will get eaten. And you'll have really big bass, no doubt. But you won't, again, you'll be back into kind of an unbalanced situation where you don't have at least two species of fish spawning. You know, they're, they're trying to spawn, but they're not having a successful spawn when you put bass at that lower level. So what will happen in that situation is you get no successful bass reproduction. Those adults that you stock initially will die, you know, after however many years, five, 10 years. And then since you've got no bass fry coming in, the bluegill population will stunt. And they'll be about three inches And they'll they'll get into what's called a boom bust type uh, wildlife population where they accelerate up. There's a ton of them. And then disease, because there's so many of them, there's nothing controlling their numbers. Disease and parasites and crap will get them because their their immune systems are a wreck because they're not eating enough. And then they'll die. And you'll have mass die offs. And then the, the process repeats itself. Stephen, do you remember that pond that we did that had all those little bluegill in it over there? It used to be Kenny Rogers Farm, but it was across from the golf course over there behind those big brick barns over in Colbert. I don't know if you remember that pond. We were there um, with Dr. Gilbert in school. I ended up managing that pond for years um, after after Kenny Rogers got rid of it. And then the, I think the next the next guy split that that property in half. So like the golf course on the other side of the road wasn't part of that property anymore. And uh, yes, yes, we did. Mm -hmm. Midwest, what's up, man? Go blue. Oh, well, I, well, sure. Go blue. Guess we got Michigan fans in the chat. Hey, they won, though. That was a pretty good game. I watched that one. Their defense looks strong, man. It looks better than Georgia's defense this year. I think if we – that'll be a, that'll be a heck of a game because Georgia's offense is looking better. But the defense, I don't know, didn't look so good. They gave up some rushing yards to Tech. I don't know. I don't think their hearts were in it for Tech, though. We'll see how it goes against Alabama this week. Anyway, yes, going back to what the, we were talking about um, – there were that little pond over there that Steve and I were talking about. Um, it had a couple big bass in it, like we just described, and it was just full of stunted bluegill. So it was weird too, because it is enough years later, it was probably like, God, I don't even know, almost probably 10 years later, not quite 10 years later, eight, eight years later, probably. Um, the guy called me out to that property. His name was Jewett Tucker, but Jewett passed away. So I lost that contract. I don't know who has it now, if anyone. Um, but that it was like a three, I think three or four acre pond there. Then it was just stunted out with, with small bluegill there. All the bluegill were like that. And all the bluegill had really big eyes. And that's a tip that you're dealing with a stunted fish population too, because their eyes and kind of their head, well, a little bit, but usually their eyes, especially in that situation for the bluegill, their eyes continue to grow and the rest of their body doesn't. So when you see a, a fish, I'll show it to you. I'm, if you guys have followed on Instagram, I'll put some pictures of crappy that look like that up. You'll see it in crappy too, where their eyes too big for their head, like too big for their body. That is a classic sign of stunning. So I got that upon as a, a, a management deal, uh, like I said, probably about 10 years later, I didn't realize it was that pond. I'd kind of forgotten about that pond. I felt like I was having like deja vu. It's like I was looking around. I was like, I think I've been here before. So that guy, uh, Jewett, wouldn't 
drain and restock. Like I told him we should just start it from scratch and do it right, but he wouldn't do it. So that's okay. Right. That's I've learned to manage around that because nobody takes that advice or hardly anybody anyway. So what I did in there was I had uh, the second best thing that I had was a bunch of stunted bass or a bunch of bass from other ponds that I was, you know, managing that I could get a hold of bigger bass, you know, in the 12 to 14 inch range. And stock those so that's exactly what i did and i put those bass in there and i really don't like doing that because what y'all notice too i've done this a few times when you transport bass that are stunted from one pond to the next pond even when you put them in that situation packed full of fish they don't grow like you expect them to grow about half the bass that you transport will get healthy and grow really well and about half of them just kind of stay stuck and stunted and and like their weights come around a little bit they look a little bit better but they don't do what you expect that they would do and that's why you know we say don't transport fish don't stock fish anywhere else um they're not, it's not going to work the way you think it is it never did for me anyway and i only did it when i absolutely had to you know i had he managed he, he hired me to manage the pond and to correct it he wouldn't take my advice on how to do it right. Fortunately, in that pond, there wasn't any crappy or other types of competing fish. There might have been a few bullheads in there, but there wasn't. I wasn't having too much trouble with competing fish. I just had a whole crap load of uh, stunted bluegill. So, put a feeder on. That was not. Well, that wasn't a problem. He was good for that. Started feeding those stunted bluegill. Put some weight back on them introduce some bass that were big enough to eat them. And I did about 15 or 20 per acre. I think I did, I think I'm probably around 20 per 20 fish per acre. And, um, and then just let it go for a couple of years. And then after a couple of years, he, he kind of quizzed me about, um, doing thread fin shad. He was interested in stocking some shad and I didn't have a problem with that. So we threw some thread fins in there and, um, The thread fin, that was one of the ponds that you, the thread fin just took off, like just blew up in that pond. There were so many thread fins in that pond that I ended up taking. I had a I had a, a guy who wanted hybrid stripers, and I think I put about, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 hybrid stripers in that pond because I had so many thread fin in that pond that it, I just didn't think it would matter. That kid, he had a, a little girl after about – Two years after I stocked the hybrids, he had his little girl down there. She was a little kid fishing with her Snoopy rod. And one of those hybrids took whatever bait she was using and snatched her Snoopy rod out of her hand and off into the lake. And uh, there was big problems. Everybody was crying and they're very upset that they lost their Snoopy rod to a hybrid. Let me go back through these questions real quick. Yep, Stevens Stevens nailing it. Most Georgia bass already have Florida genetics. Forage and balance makes all the difference. Um, that is correct, sir. You are 100% right. Um, I think it touches back on what we talked about. There's been so many F1 stock. There's been so many guys who've gone everywhere and grabbed pure Floridas and stocked them. That uh, And the one thing, Stephen, have you seen anything on uh, CPUE on Florida bass versus uh, F1s? Because I haven't done that study either. I'm just going off of like, uh, you know, observations. I haven't seen any data on that. But the CPUE means catch for unit effort. And it basically means how many fish you're catching per hour. And I can promise you in pure Florida bass ponds, your CPUE drops. You do not catch as many fish. Uh, there's a whole, there's 10,000 acres of Florida bass right behind this place I'm sitting right now. And sometimes you go out there and you'll knock eight or 10 fish in a day. Most of the time you, they don't take lures. Those guys who are guiding out there always use golden shiners, always use wild shiners. They don't even try to guide guys with artificial lures out there. Um, and I think that's part of what's going on. This particular lake does throw off some nice bass and it gets a high pressure, high fishing pressure 
all from guides. Like you'll see guides come pouring in here. Sometimes you can go, I'll go fishing out there and I'll see 10 boats and they're all guides. So you get high fishing pressure with live bait in Florida a lot. And that changes, that changes the game a little bit there too. It makes it very challenging. Um, anyway. Just let me read this real quick. <laughs> Steven saying you know, one to two year old, uh, 12 to 16 inch bass. Yeah, those work if you yeah, exactly if you can get them. They're usually not available. Um, it's really easy to grow a bass 12 to 16 inches if you guys have been following the other page. You know, we, we, we're, our, our bass are past that now. We've got some fish at 17 and a half just after two growing seasons. So in the right conditions, even the Floridas that are slow growing, you know, we've gotten over a pound of growth a year on our Florida bass in that pond. And I don't mean to sound like that's bad because that's not bad. That's actually really good. But compared to what we could have, that's, you know, it's it's a draft. Again, we've got northerns that are 4.1, 4, 3.8, 3.9. Um, two pounds, you know, heavier than that, a pound. Yeah, Stephen, I agree with you on that, man. He's saying that they don't, they're not as aggressive and they don't bite and they do end up getting bigger. And I think the, I think, I wonder how much of that is they get bigger because they're not being handled as much because they're not in live wells as much, you know, and you can even see that just down at the fish hatchery when they're like this big and you're picking them up. If you walk up to a tank full of Florida bass, they'll back away. They will be like, like you have a hula hoop, a invisible hula hoop around you. And when you walk up to a tank of Florida's, they will move away from you and very timid, very intimidated, uh, very cautious. Cautious is a better word, I think, than intimidated. I don't know if you can intimidate a bass, but cautious, very, uh, you know, very in tune with their environment. You know, I wonder if they're, I, I don't know, I don't know what makes them that way, but that's just how they are. On the flip side of that coin, you can go right to the, the next tank over that's full of northern fish or full of F1 fish, and it is the exact opposite. They're, they'll crowd you. They'll come right up. They'll, they won't move away from you. Right. So, and I'm talking fish this big, you know, so that's obviously genetically ingrained. They haven't learned that. I mean, hell, this fish at the fish hatch were feed trained. So every day they go out and people throw food in there to them. And even when they do that, the Florida fish move back away and, you know, they're, they're kind of reserved in that way or, you know, I don't know the right exact adjective for that. Cautious. They're cautious. And I think that cautiousness, that reservedness, that's what makes them harder to catch. And you'll see it, man. You Like I said, every single time. And it doesn't even matter. I've stocked Florida's um, a few times down coastal plain areas and stuff where they do get similar type growth rates to what these northerns are getting. So I think where you stock the Florida is, is important. And I mean, it was, there's scientific proof that they get bigger, you know. We have that. We know that. But why they get bigger, I think that's that's the question that, you know, hasn't been answered. And I don't know. If I owned a pond, give me the lottery and say, hey, go build a lake. I'm not part of the only reason I would put pure Florida's in it would be to do what I'm doing in this lake right now and trying to get F1s born into the system year over year. All right. Stephen coming through someone. Sam Spencer just said, look at the state records jump as the Florida genetic moved West. Something to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree, man. 
Um, I can grow good bass. I don't really care about their genetics, their genetic makeup. Like I said, I can get them out of a ditch young and put them into a balanced situation where they got plenty of food and I'll be growing huge bass. Now start, um, start getting into super huge bass, you know, 12 pound plus bass. That's a different story. Getting bass to eight pounds, not too hard. You can do that just about anywhere. Uh, but after eight pounds, that's where it gets really challenging. That's where, uh, you have to be very good and very, um, you have to be very observant about what's going on. And, and I think it's important too, like if you're a consultant, just to be upfront with your clients, like in the situation I'm in right now, this two and a half acre pond, I don't think we're going to have any trouble going to eight pounds. Um, we might even see one at the, this time next year. Because as bass climb up, you know, we're getting about two pounds of growth on those bigger fish. So we got four pounds right now. We could see one go to six pounds. We would expect to see him go to six pounds because we've had two pounds of growth each year, each growing season, first season, second season. Into the third season, though, we've got a unique situation in this lake that says, um, how do I put this? Okay, so we stocked the pond and let the bluegill feed for about a year with no bass in the population. So they're in a unique situation in that there is a large population of large bluegill in this pond because it's new that won't ever be there again. So these bass are climbing. It's like kind of coming upstairs, you know, a bass with a mouth that big can eat, but fish this big, this big can eat, you know, each season as the mouth grows on the bass, it can eat bigger and bigger forage and these bass are climbing up onto a population of bluegill that's pretty much unnatural. You know, they're not going to ever have this, this density of big bluegill again, that you'll never see that again because of the bass predation working on, working it down, working it down. So that's one reason why that's new lake effect. That's, that's kind of, we can group that into that new lake effect idea. So oh, getting, getting stuff beeping at me. We could see a few of these bass go past eight pounds in the third year. And I've actually seen that, but it, they've been F1s that have done that. So this is kind of, I'm kind of in no man's land for experience. I'm not sure if we'll see that. I'll be disappointed if we don't get a few fish past six pounds this year. But like I said, it's because there's so many big bluegill on feed in there at this particular season where these bass, they've kind of been, there's nothing been feeding on them. We could see some explosive growth on a few of these bigger fish, which brings up another really good point. You know, we stocked up like 105 bass into the pond. We've lost five. So I know for a fact we've got at least a hundred. If oh, I lost, I lost my train of thought on that. Let me go back to the, it'll come back to me. Let me go back to the questions here. Stephen wrote something else. Um, had trophy copper nose with eight to 10 inch Florida bass. Oh, so what he's mean by, he says pecker headed out um, or Debo dinked out uh, our friend Debo over on uh, YouTube there. He does dinks. And so if you overstock a bass population, what will happen is we're intentionally stunning it, right? Um, they'll, if you, if you put, you know, say 200 fish per acre or whatever, there's just not enough forage in that system for the bass to grow so their their growth stops but we did that intentionally because in this particular situation that steven's describing he's going for trophy bluegill so that's essentially what all our lakes are trophy bluegill ponds because the bass are all one pound the, all their mouths are the same size so they can't eat bluegill that get bigger than their gait and then those bluegill being on feed, there's two things going for those bluegill. One, they have no pressure. They have no predators to eat them. Two, they're on feed. But three, their numbers are very low because of all the hungry bass and they're gobbling up everything that's born. Um, they have plenty more natural food too. So this catch and release ideology that everybody thinks, again, making assumptions that all bass grow all the time, uh, they don't. And all we've done is created a bunch of trophy bluegill ponds. Or legs. <clears throat> I'm gonna have to get um, 
partners to come on here. Steven, I have to get you on here so you can talk so my voice doesn't wear out like this. Uh, you mean pounds, Steven? I'll be surprised if I get one to 12 pounds. Um, if I do get one to 12 pounds, it will be one, two, at the end of the next, not this growing season, not the next growing season, but it's probably into that, into that fifth year growing season. And then that's the only shot that we're going to have on a pond that small. I think you have to have that new lake effect, you know, to, to get a fish that big in a pond that small. And it goes back to that conversion factor. We just, we only have two and a half acres of water. We have a limited number of, you know, forage is limited. It's not an, it's not just plentiful all the time. So we've done everything that we can do to get that bass the most forage. And I just remembered what I was thinking about. So take those hundred bass that we stocked, right? Well, just on if you flip a coin half those bass are probably going to be male so that means there's only about 50 bass in that pond that can even get to 10 pounds right they're only the females are going that big males are topping out about five pounds so i've had to do this before where if you're lucky enough to get them in the spring, you can sex them. You just keep as many males as you can on the electric fishing boat. Just go get them right off the bed. If it's a male, it's coming out. But there's a new trick that some of these fish hatcheries have. You're fortunate enough to, to get in one of these hatcheries, and that's all female bass. They You can buy just females. And some of the guys that I've seen trying to use a female bass, they're trying to use it like trying to protect that population and only having females and not having any males, no reproduction in the system. And they're going to add these fish over time. They're going to basically just stock in the bass that they want to get superior growth. And that's fine, but I wouldn't do it that way. Um, just based on my experience, I think you're going to get males in there. If you, especially if you have a stream, you'd have to have a really unique pond, not to be worried about any fish coming in there. So I would just expect to get males in an all-female bass population. But if you just stocked the initial stocking of the 35 to 40 bass per acre, like I'm recommending, you double your chances. If you just did all-female, 40 all-female bass per acre and just throw them in there and say, let it go, That's that it's, what's going to happen is going to happen you still have doubled your chances of growing a fish over 10 pounds because you know, the original stocking was no, there's no males. So that's important to remember, you know, um, we only have about 50 fish that even have a chance to get in that big. Go back to questions here. Frank's asking, um, are the red ears for snail control? Um, snails are, host to most of the parasites that get on fish, Frank. So, you know, you see those fish with like red sores on there or any number of parasites that your fish could have. Um, that comes generally from the snails, like the, the, the snails are host to those parasites. So by using the red ear, to control the snail population, you're reducing the amount of parasites on your fish, which when you think about it's really important because all those parasites, worms and, you know, whatever else we go into a list of parasites, but all those parasites create stress on the fish. So if you can reduce the snail population and reduce the parasites on the fish, you're reducing the stress on the fish. And that's important. Secondarily, those snails are a source of protein for red ear, which then in turn become a source of protein for bass. So if you don't stock the red ear, if you don't have them, you are losing some of the productivity you could have because if you did have them, that would be, they would, red ears would be eating the snails and then the red ears would be eaten by the bass. So whatever, uh, you know, your natural snail population is there, um, wouldn't be accessed without the red ear. So you'd be having, you know, less fish and the red ear spawn earlier in the spring than the bluegills. They get a spawn a little earlier. So you get a nice forage pop off of them earlier in the season. So I hope that answers your question, but that's, that's why we use them. 
I think that should cover it. I can't think of any other reasons. Other than they're they're good to eat. They're really good to eat. Oh, sure, Frank. No problem, man. <clears throat> I'm having um I'm just having allergies again. It must be the time of year. Uh, nasal drip is situation. I think the talking gets it going too. Usually don't talk for 40 minutes straight. I try not to talk at all, really, but you know. So yeah, back to making assumptions. Well, one guy made an assumption too. Um, he, we were discussing, you know, another fallacy that you always hear floating around is the aquatic weeds. You know, the aquatic weeds are necessary habitat for for the bass. And again, now you're talking about um, I don't know what deal you're referring to, Tim. You having a lot of sores on your fish? So, again, they've heard on TV forever that, um, you know, all this important of habitat. And I'm not trying to take away from habitat. Obviously, habitat, fish habitat is extremely important. But you can have other forms of habitat for your fish to hide in, like rock piles, gravel beds, um, brush piles, stumps, you know. All those things don't overgrow the pond and don't reduce the, the plankton population. And that's uh, that's the part where, you know, the guys on TV have kind of messed up and kind of shot, you know, are not helping anybody in the pond management or small lake management business by basically spreading misinformation about the importance of aquatic weed habitat. Because your aquatic weeds, you know, they're making the assumption that that habitat is really important. Well, I'll counter that point with this point. You have great, you have a lot of habitat. That's really good habitat. Okay, wonderful. But that habitat is reducing the base of the food chain. You're reducing the plankton density because those plants are taking the nutrients that the plankton needs to grow. And you can see it, especially on certain kinds of plants. Um, the, the pond will kind of be that nice green color until the, until the summertime comes. And then the, the plant, like plants like Kara will get in there and all of a sudden the water's crystal clear and there's, there's nice plants everywhere. You see plants all over the place, but the water is as clear as vodka. Okay. That's a problem because that clear water, that taking the water from green, a nice green plankton bloom to clear is drastically reducing the base of the food chain. So when you drastically reduce the phytoplankton, you drastically reduce, reduce zooplankton. All right, right there is where you just lost because every fish born now doesn't have a food resource that it needs to survive to get up on. If, if it's a bluegill, it doesn't have the food resource that needs to survive to get past a week old to get onto aquatic insects and other things. It, it dies way too fast. So you won't see the aquatic plants killing your fish because they're almost microscopic when it happens. Hey, what's up, Tim? Thanks for joining, man. So great. We've got a bunch of, you know, wonderful fish habitat for all our fish that didn't, that were born and died in 10 minutes because they had no zooplankton to eat. You see where I'm going with that? Again, you're making the assumptions that this habitat, habitat is going to grow all these fish and it's simply not it's actually doing the opposite you can get i mean we'll just use our example pond you'll do a lot um keeping the, the weeds out of the pond letting the pond have that plankton bloom letting letting it have the zooplankton because when it has the, the, the phytoplankton has the zooplankton now you get five times, 10 times, I don't even know the number, but it's a significantly higher number of bluegill survive because they have food to eat. Crystal clear water. Yeah, Tim says he's got a pond like that near his house. It's got crystal clear water. So in those crystal clear water ponds, watch what happens, man. Normally what you'll see in those 
is exceptionally long and skinny bass because generally like you'll get a couple of good um spawns in the springtime earlier in the year and then the bass have a lot of forage to eat but as the weeds come up and the water clears up they're not those though they're not as successful those the, they're the bluegill and the in the shad or whatever you have are still spawning but most of their fry are dying because they don't have the food resources so you'll see bass will get a good they'll be healthy for a while and then, then towards the last half of the growing season the the forage goes away because it because the plant growth comes that takes that down and you'll see bass that are exceptionally long and skinny in lakes like that or ponds like that and you start paying attention to it you'll see it yeah frank uh, people want crystal clear water Yeah, you're right, man. It's not good. Um, and, and most people do. They want that. Uh oh, get some rain. They want that super clear water. Um, they think that that's healthy and they don't understand that the green water is actually the most productive water. And <clears throat> I mean, that's fine for your average Joe Blow who's just bought their lake property just to sit there and look at the water, you know. But Fishermen should know better, you know. It's really not fishermen's fault either, though. I mean, when you consider, like, none of this stuff has been promoted on TV or in, you know, mass media ever. I think, well, there's just not many guys like me and Steven who can articulate this stuff down to a point where, because this is complex stuff, dudes. I mean, I ain't lying. It took us, it's, it's a hard, hard, hard degree to get. and. I was just lucky enough. I got this way and Steven's this way too, because it's part of his job too. He talks to people about this every day. I learned it. Like I learned very quickly. Like I understood all these concepts when I graduated from school, right? No problem. I got the whole game clock. Great. Making money. Great. But understanding something here and articulating it here are two completely different skills, right? And you don't get, you're just not naturally born with the ability to talk about complex scientific ideas unless you've talked about them and talked about them and talked about them. And that's how I got here. Um, anybody who called me, you know, asking about their pond, I had to take this much information and condense it to this much information, but still make it make sense. And Stephen does the same thing because he works for the extension service. So he gets people, you know, just average folks who don't have college fisheries degrees and crap like that calling and asking for help. He can't lay out a bunch of these complex ideas because he'll just lose them. And that's not his job. You know, his job is to, to help those folks try to, you know, manage their ponds. Very similar to the way my job was. So. Yeah, Josh. Josh saying it changes his approach to catching largemouth. Sure, man. I think um, I think all this stuff's really important, man. Um, you know, I know like you probably see like most of the time on YouTube or most of this stuff, you just see uh, how to drag a worm, how to rig a bait, how to fish this, how to fish that. But you don't see this biology stuff, you know. And I've I've never really met anyone that sat down and, and listened to this honestly and left understanding the environment better that and it made them a worse fisherman. You know what I'm saying? You don't get worse by understanding this stuff better, you know. And I think you can take, you certainly like, I can't coach people on how to go win the Bassmaster Classic or even win a fishing tournament. I don't fish in them. Um, but I can certainly help people, you know, understand the biology a little bit better. And like with this project, hopefully, hopefully get people to 
understand these genetics variables, you know, understand these balance variables, understand the, 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 understand that this is complex and that the group think cycle of, you know, just talking about bass fishing the same way over and over and over again is over with, you know, we need, we need these, we need education here so we can move forward. So we can begin addressing the, the challenges that our fisheries have in a smart way. And that's what I'm doing here. You know, I try to help anybody who asks and I still get a lot of blowback. You know, I'm not telling people what they want to hear and I never will <clears throat> until they change the dynamic of the group think to it being accurate, you know, and stop making, again, go back to what we just talked about, making assumptions. These dudes are making assumptions and isn't there a saying about making us ass out of you and me or something like that? That's true. Oh, Josh has got some stuff coming through. Um, you having bass all around them at Beaver Dam? It's TVA. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Those TVA lakes are managed pretty well, man. Those guys do a good job. And, you know, it's different in the bigger lakes a little bit. Um, and that's the that's the one thing that I get these guys who want to argue or whatever that whatever they want to call it. I don't really call it arguing, but instantly they have to move the goalpost and are like, well, "Yeah, well, you're talking about ponds and I'm talking about lakes." And I'm like, "Yeah, but the the ponds is the fundamentals of lake management. You don't you you don't understand." a two, three species system and how that and how the balance works in that. How in the hell do you suddenly understand a 30 species system that's 25,000 acres when you don't understand a two acre? Okay. That's not how that works either. <clears throat> that's not how that works. It's funny how, I don't know, egos get involved because the guys pride themselves on their knowledge of this stuff. And unfortunately, like I said, I mean, there's been no, nobody I've ever seen, you know, in media try what I'm attempting to try. And I don't know. I feel like I've been pretty successful. We got over 22,000 across all platforms now. And after next year, oh, it'll be big. Tim says he understands um, verbalizing what you know. That's an obstacle. And uh, yeah, man, it's, it's, that's just, uh, oops. <clears throat> that's the nature of knowing anything, you know, knowing what to do and knowing how to articulate it are two different skills. But you'll get good at it. You know, you just keep working at it, you know, and this has certainly helped me um, on Instagram and all the social media. It's a condensing, you know, of uh, of information and and art being able to articulate something into a few sentences instead of writing a paragraph, you know, uh, that's that's the hard part. I think, especially with the way social media is moving right now, in that um, everything's short attention span theater. I mean, I literally get guys talking crap to me on YouTube on a 58 second video that I addressed what they're talking to me about at the last part of the video. It's like you couldn't keep you, your attention span couldn't go for 60 seconds to listen to the whole thing. You're making comments that were addressed at the end of the video. You watch for 30 seconds and then you took more time to make a smart aleck dumb comment than if you just would have watched the whole video. That's what we're up against. You got to summarize. And that's why I do so much short format stuff. Uh, one, because I'm not great at editing long format stuff yet. Um, you, it's easier to feed the short format video game and get a bunch of views than it is the long format because you need basically be a filmmaker to get long format people to pay any amount of attention to you at all. 
you have to edit it properly. And I understand. I mean, I'm look. I watch. I I can't watch my own videos. Like I I, I click on the video. It's like yeah, the information is great, but the video sucks because I'm not editing it right. You know. And I didn't go to school to be a video editor. So I've got a learning curve there that I'm fighting with right now. But that's, you know, that's what YouTube's for. There's plenty of videos on how to edit, and I'm just battling through it. <laughs> Thanks, Tim, man. I appreciate you guys. I really do eight tonight i thought it would be dropped tonight because everybody's probably traveling for the holidays that's another thing i've noticed with youtube man it's like these numbers i i think i don't know i don't really trust this little scheme they got going <clears throat> um I, i've got some of my lives especially the lives will be it'll show on one screen in the youtube studio that there was like 160 viewers but then you go to the next screen to break that down and it's showing like 55 viewers have watched this video. And I'm like, wait a minute, it says 160 over here and it says 55 over here. So which is it? I think they might be skewing it on me a little bit to, uh, well, to make money because they don't want to pay. <clears throat> I think that's what's going on. There's, but there's a, there's something in the live, like the, none of the other, like the shorts and, uh, and, the, and the regular videos don't do that at all. It's just these live things that I do. that will have a massive discrepancy on what it says on one page, to the next page, when you break it down, it's just like a, like sometimes it's a hundred views different. And <clears throat> I don't know. I find that interesting. I, I've only there so far there's been like eight guys is the most that I've seen on here. So it'll be interesting to see like what it shows up. You know, how many people have watched this one? It will get some, it'll trickle for about a week and then it just kind of dies. People quit paying attention to it. I don't know. It's crazy. Uh, <clears throat> so it's gotten to be something about talk. Here I am at the, about an hour again, and I'm starting to get all these nasal itchy nose and nasal. It's got to be something about talking a lot and time of year that's triggering my allergies. Throat's all scratchy. Let me scroll back through and make sure I didn't miss anybody's question. Well, everything looks pretty caught up. Okay, good. Yeah, Tim, I agree with that last statement. You can learn learn a lot more from listening, but you know, you got to be listening to somebody who knows what they're talking about, and that's the problem that I think our fisheries are facing. Is that the guys who've been doing a lot of talking? Again, they should stay over in their lane over there about how to drag a jig or how to hook a worm or how to fish a spinnerbait eight different ways that's fine. But when you start coming over here into preaching about being a good conservationist and catch and release and starving our bass populations half to death, that's where I start getting irritated. It's like, all right, you've passed over into my lane now, junior. And, uh, mm -mm, you in the wrong spot. You shouldn't be talking like that. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, you're spreading misinformation and then that's just compounded and compounded and compounded to where now that has become the general knowledge. And it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. Go back and look at anybody who was a bass fisherman in the seventies before all this nonsense started. Hell go on Google and, and type in, um, you know, how to manage a bass population or fisheries management for bass, or anything remotely close to that, and show me where a scientist tells you to catch and release everything. You ain't going to find it because it's not there. You know, it's just a complete disconnect from reality. And I kind of lose respect for those guys because, you know, they've been fortunate enough to make enough money 
that they can fish for a living and they can do their shows or their YouTube channels or whatever, but so lazy that they can't even type a question like that into a Google search and go, Hey, is what I'm saying true? You know, let me double check. Let me, you know, I know they're, you know, do they not even know that there's guys who are scientists that study this stuff? I think they do now. Um, I have quite a few of them that follow me, but don't participate, which I find interesting. Again, it goes back to ego. They think they, they think they got all those followers because they're so smart. And uh, I think a lot of followers has a little bit of, of luck involved as well. I think all this stuff has a little bit of luck involved. Hey, Wham Bates. All right, man. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Glad you finally made it. I'm already having um allergy reactions again or whatever is going on. I don't know what's going on with me. So, yeah, looking forward on the pond, though. Um, I would expect to see some another good growth. Oh, Tim's saying he's gone back and rewatched just about every live stream. Yeah, man. Thanks. I appreciate that. Those um, podcasts have done a lot of good for a lot of folks. I'm going to be going on a couple more. Um, the dudes over at um, Monster Bass have contacted me. <clears throat> and maybe in January, I'll go on their podcast. And then Andrew over on Tackle Talk. I think I'm going to make my fifth appearance over there. Um, I don't have He's going to give me a date on that one yet. And um, those are really good, man. Andrew's done great with his with his Tackle Talk podcast. Um, <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, he's gotten really popular. Over three, going on four million downloads now. Uh, his Tackle Talk is... Uh, he made a, a comment to me the other day. I was talking to him. I think he's selling more of those Dakota lithium batteries than all of the pro fishermen combined. So I'm glad to see that. Um, I think that you're going to see pro fishing. There's going to be less of a significant, there's, there's going to be less of their impact here. And more of impact guys like mine, Stevens, and and um, I think the I think it's because it's a saturated market for those that type of content, and yeah, Tim said it right there. He loves talking about baits, and that's why I, I definitely add some baits. But I also have you noticed I add the science, you know, kind of about you know put some scientific fact in there with the baits. And those guys can't do that. <laughs> I feel so bad for them. Um, yeah, they're, they've got a saturation problem where everybody's doing the same thing over and over and over again. And you're seeing guys like Alex Rudd. You're seeing guys like um, Oliver Nye. I've been, on, I've, been on Al, I've been on Rudd's podcast twice. I've been on Oliver Nye's once on Big Bass Dreams over there. Um, of course, Tackle Talk I've gone on so many times. It's ridiculous. but you're starting to see those the smart guys in this in this social media, you know, podcasting, you know, realm moving towards the science because there's so much more content than just how to fish a jerkbait or whatever those guys have going. Um, they just copy each other. You know, it's it's nothing, it's nothing really new. I'm not saying I don't get good fishing tips from those dudes. I absolutely do. But once you've made that video once, you know, where are you at? I mean, where's your content going to be? It just gets very redundant to me. Um, there's very few guys that can keep that new. I think, I think tactical bass and I like those guys. I've met those guys a couple times too. I met them over at um, bull shad swim baits. And then I bumped into them again over at iCast and uh, Tim and Matt, are genuine dudes, man. They're as cool as they seem on their videos. 
really nice guys. And I think as far as the fishing videos go, I think those guys do one of the better jobs. But I think I think uh, Oliver Oliver Nye does a great job, and and uh, Rudd Rudd's doing fantastic work over there with what he's doing. But you're going to see those guys um, as they figure this out and go, holy crap, you know, you've got the entire science library. The nice thing I have is there's never going to be another year two at Sugar Hill Outdoors. You know, that's over and done with. So you, when year three comes, the content's all new again. You know, it's the same pond. It's the same dog and pony show, but we've got completely different growth. We've got completely different, you know, everything's going to be different. So I really never have to worry about content, you know, every pond is different, you know? So however many ponds that I can get to log on and do this stuff with me, every one of those will be a little bit different. And that keeps, that keeps the content clean and then unredundant, you know? So I'm not worried about it at all. <laughs> you got that right, Stephen. People do not listen, man. You can, we can sit here and have this kind of conversation for this amount of time, tell these dudes, break this stuff down and then turn around and they will go right out <laughs> and do what they saw on YouTube. Um, they're looking for confirmation bias. They're looking for, uh, They saw it the first time they see it. They think that's correct because they didn't hear it before. And then they're looking for you to confirm what they heard. They want you to tell them that they're right. And it takes a special kind of person to wade through it. And I've just been really lucky, too, because the other thing that really helps is just being able to hold the fish up and go, look, this is a two pound Florida bass. This is a four pound northern bass. 20,000 people watch me stock them and have done, you know, have been along this on this ride. You don't have any or any more arguments. You know, I just knocked out everything that you could you could uh, argue with me about. And I've noticed after this year, I'm really getting a lot less blowback. Like people are actually starting to listen a little bit, Stephen. Yes, I do hammer it. I, I, I hammer it. I think you said one time I can beat a horse into super glue. <laughs> I like that expression. <laughs> yes, I do hammer it. Um, it has to do with me being extremely irritated with just the state, the nature of things. And that's another point too. We don't have to worry about the content. Um, you can't, you can't, you can't go over this stuff enough times. Um, there's going to be different aspects to all this stuff in every question and every situation that it keeps it, it keeps it new. Oh, I appreciate that, Stephen. Man, yeah. Like I said, man, anything you need from me anytime, man. I'm going to start doing, um, once I get, uh, once I get a store, it'll, it'll be better because then I can, um, I can refer people to product like an Amazon store. I think that's the next move too. I got to figure out how to do that, but there's a YouTube store you can do as well, but I'm not qualified for it yet. We're about halfway now. We're at 1500 watch hours. Um, and you got to get 4,000 to get, unlock everything on YouTube as for, for financial purposes. That's why I keep going live and doing this stuff because this to count towards that. Um, the shorts videos don't count towards that though. I get a lot of good views on shorts, but it actually doesn't add to my, um, my 4,000 count. I don't know. It's, it's calculated a different way. Like I said, they like, they love moving the goalposts around so they don't have to write you a check. It's all good. <clears throat> It'll get there. Once next year is going to, third year is always the best. Third year, um, third year, fourth year, fifth year on ponds are stupid. Uh, on these new ponds and um, <laughs> yeah, Steven says, cue the videos. I, that, I've got the playlist. Actually, if you, the playlist is the way to go, go to the playlist and hit it and then just mute it and let it run. And that'll, that'll play all my videos back to back to back in the playlist. You're right about that, Tim. Uh, 
learning is a well I've noticed too there's there's people who there's one there's it's either real black and white with folks they're either constantly learning or they're not learning at all there's very few people in between and I like reading and I like learning stuff and you know I like helping people learn this stuff but you know, hopefully it helps folks. I think it does. I mean, I've had way too many dudes like, like give me a compliment about, um, about this stuff that for me to, for me to not think it's not helping people. I think it absolutely is helping folks. <clears throat> okay, Steven, I'll check that out, man. appreciate it. Uh, well, allergies are rolling again, man. Not as bad as last time, man. Last time my nose was about to itch off. It's funny, though. I wonder if there's something in this old room that's getting me. We need to do mold remediation in here. Anyway, it's over an hour, and uh, it's been a good one. I hope you guys learned some stuff. I appreciate you. I don't see any more questions through the feed or anything, so I'll just get off. But um, next Sunday, hopefully we'll do it again. And I appreciate everybody being here. And if you have any questions, just write them down and throw them in the chat box for next time. And I'll be sure to address them. Thanks a bunch, guys. I'll see you next time.